I have the great pleasure and privilege now to introduce our next speaker, Rashid Arain, whose work has been a great, great inspiration for all of us conceiving this uh, um, event. Rashid uh, is a London-based conceptual artist, sculptor, painter, writer, and curator. He graduated in civil engineering from the University of Karachi, and he's been working uh, as a visual artist ever since his arrival in London in 1964. In 72, he joined the Black Panther movement, and six years later, he was founding editor of the journal Black Phoenix, which in 89 became third text. A very warm welcome to Rashid Arain and his manifesto, Art Beyond Art, The Barbarism of Civilization Must End, a manifesto for the 21st century. Good to see you. <laughs> art beyond art. The barbarism of civilization must end. A manifesto for the 21st century. Is history of humanity not the history of violence, what Walter Benjamin called the barbarism of civilization. The 6,000 or 7,000 years of civilization has given us tremendous knowledge of ourselves of the world around us and of the cosmos. We are now much more knowledgeable, intelligent, and clever. We can now penetrate and read the visible, invisible areas of the universe. And yet, we are no wiser than the Mesopotamians, the ancient Egyptians, Greeks, Chinese, Indians, or Arabs. Our imagination can reach beyond the Mars, but is unable to resolve even small disagreements, conflicts, and disputes within ourselves without a resort to confrontation and violence. It is violence, not the violence of the narcissist ego, not only of the high priest, kingdom and empires, ancient and contemporary, but what is inside of us, male and female, always trying to overpower others. Didn't art, among other things, try to exercise this ego, but failed? And consequently, are we now facing not only our own destruction, but the annihilation, annihilation of life on Earth? The 20th century began with great ideas in art, literature, science, music, philosophy, and so on, which gave great hope for the future of humanity. But this hope was dashed with the violence that this century unleashed killing more than 100 million people, perhaps the most violent history century in the history of humanity. Can we explain this paradox 
Only by blaming a social political system, but extricating ourselves as individuals from, from it by believing that we as artists are only engaged in something constructive. It is not based on the naivety of opposition, sorry, and confrontation with, and confrontation with the system, out of which, in fact, emerged the so-called the avant-garde that, in my view, has badly failed. When Duchamp threw a journal on the face of the bourgeoisie, what did he expect from it? Did the journal not come back bouncing and hitting the face of Duchamp himself? Did he at that time realize the futility of his action? It was only in 1950s that Duchamp somewhat realized the actual fate of his works, perhaps accepting not only his own failure, but also of the Dada and Surrealist movements. Accepting his eventual fate, perhaps cynically, and then by replicating his works and offering them to the bourgeoisie in exchange for a sense of celebrity in his old age. Did Duchamp not recapitulate to what he had been confronting all his life? This has, in fact, been the fate of the Amman God. It presumed to resolve the situation by filling the gap between art and life, but couldn't. Because the artist's own ego wouldn't allow him or her to come down from his high intellectual pedestal and become part of the everyday life. The struggle of the avant-garde was in fact only a confrontation between the narcissism of two egos, which eventually reconciled by coming together and happily embarrassing each other. Our today is just trapped in the facile idea of this confrontation, producing merely media scandals and sensations, and widening further the gap between art and life in which it now operates purely as a commodity like any other marketable commodity. Inflating the artist's ego further and turning him or her into a celebrity which can entertain the public spectacularly but without any substance performing any significant social function. The failure of the Omegaan was not the failure of ideas, but of the way they were appropriated by the very forces 
the Almighty God wanted to confront. If art still has the potential of dealing with today's disturbing world situation, it cannot perform this function without liberating itself, not only from the narcissist ego, but also from which this ego leads to the bourgeois art institution. It has, no, it has to abandon the making of objects that are displayable in the museum or and sold as commodities as a marketplace. In order to enter the world of everyday life and its collective energy that is struggling not only to improve their life itself, but to save this to save this planet from total destruction. However, there has been also there has also been a different struggle in art, whose beginning we can perhaps attribute to William Morris art and class movement some ideas of which reemerged in the 20th century as part of the revolutionary forces unleashed by the Russian Revolution and then by the Baha'u'llah. But this also eventually collapsed prematurely into failure. Behind this failure were, of course, many different and extremely complex historical forces. But there is one thing that can be attributed to all these movements. Any attempt to impose an idea onto the masses and without any consideration of the nature of people's own creative resources and abilities, no matter how beneficial the idea may be to the, to the people, it cannot succeed. Altruism cannot perform any true social function if it is an extraction of the narcissist ego. There was also the problem of methodology or the absence of a dialectical process through which the gap between art and life could be filled. This process somewhat did emerge, though paradoxically, during and with the land art movement of the late 60s and 70s. During this time, the making of objects in the form of paintings our sculpture was abundant in favor of art as concept. Thanks to Duchamp for this. But art now went beyond Duchamp's object making and became engaged with the land or the earth itself. The land has always been an object of the artist's gaze, but this time the gaze didn't produce landscape painting. On the contrary, the conception of land as art itself became the artwork. This was achieved 
by intervening in their land and transforming it as something they continued to remain part of their land, either as a stationary object a word would transfer itself continually. Many artists dug holes in the ground and made dream like earthen structures. Robert Smithson turned an existing lake into a work of art. Robert Morris, on the other hand, contemplated growing of crop on a farmland and turning the whole thing into a work of art. But there was a problem. The conflict between the individualism of the narcissist ego and the collective work of the farm workers could not let the artist come to terms with the collectivity of the farm workers and allow them to become part of the work. The only choice Morris had was to abandon the project. About 10 years later, Joseph Boyes try to resolve this difficult problem by suggesting that his work of planting trees at Castle in 1982 could in fact become part of people's everyday work. It offered a model of transformative power of art, but his proposal of planting trees also failed to go beyond the idea of art, legitimized and contained by the bourgeois art institution. And although but this was open a space for the future developments. It failed to resolve the problem of art trapped within both the artist's ego and the institution that will not allow art to become part of the collectivity of people's everyday life. However, although ideas of land art as well as of boys, among other things, failed as work of individual artists, they were not absolute failures. This is important to Remember, they were not absolute failures. They were prematurely aborted, turned into institutionally manageable objects and trapped in their temporalities. But You can see how nervous I am facing all this crowd. As such, but I, yeah, yeah. I read there was some other matter. Ah, got it. But idea as knowledge can never be trapped, either as the property of an individual or the institution. They, they can always be salvaged from history. History is fundamental here. 
given a new context and make them move forward within the dynamic of new time and space. They can indeed be made to perform theoretically a transformative action in dealing with the problem of humanity today and of the 21st century. But to do this, the very concept of art will have to, as I suggested before, liberate itself from the narcissist ego, the bourgeois art institution, which facilitates and promotes art only as a saleable commodity, and then turn them into rarefied objects placed in its museum showcases. Art must then go beyond what prevails as art and integrate itself with the collective struggle of life today to recover its true social function and indeed to become a radical force of 21st century. But before I proceed further to elaborate the dialectic of this salvage, I want to pay homage to someone who even in the early days of the avant-garde realized the futility of the strategy, strategy of confronting the bourgeois ruling classes. When Hugo Ball, I wonder how many you know about Hugo Ball. When Hugo Ball, one of the pioneers of Dada, the Dada, realized it was a waste of time making fun of the bourgeoisie, he walked of the, out of the cabaret Voltaire in Zurich, which he himself had founded in the early 1960s, and to will and went to live in Ticino, Switzerland, among the poor peasants. This may appear to be romantic, but Bach's integration with life of a collective does open a way forward, particularly now when the collective life of the planet is in danger of being destroyed. The artistic imagination must freed from its self-destructive narcissist ego can enter this life and offer it is not only its salvation, but put it on the path of a better future. Hugo Ball lived at a time when history had not moved to the point when one could contemplate a piece of land as an artwork. He lived in isolation, cut off from the art world. But we, but we are now aware that a piece of land can not only be a work of art, but historically been canonized as such. A piece of land can now be conceived not merely as a conceptual art object, 
but what goes beyond its canonized object and become an ongoing and self-sustaining dynamic process with the movement generated within itself by its own agency and thus legitimize itself. The agency here is not of an individual artist. This is very important. The agency here is not of an individual artist who might have initiated the idea of land as art, but the collective work of those who work on the land. It is this collective work, not the nature, not the nature, as perceived by Smithson and Morris, which continually transport the land, producing an agency which is not only creative, but posit a, posit a progressive idea toward the solution of the problem the world is facing today will continue to, continue to face in the 21st century. What the world faces today is not just a phenomena of climate change to be studied by the scientists in the Avery Towers, but the reality of its describing consequences faced by all their life on Earth. We can and should think of the starving people of the world, but the solution to this problem lies not in the theories of the academics, but the productive creativity of these people themselves, which can be enhanced through the intervention of an artistic imagination. What the world now needs are rivers and lakes of clean water, collective farms and planting of trees all over the world. An artistic imagination can in fact help achieve all these objectives and should, in fact, lay the foundation for a radical manifesto of art in the 21st century. The rising of sea must be stopped, for which the priority must be of reducing the carbon emission in the atmosphere and planting more trees, which was, of course, the mission of Joseph Boyce. Both of these objectives can be achieved by conceptualizing the process of desalination as an ongoing, continuous artwork with its own dynamics and agency. The establishment of desalination plants around the world, it can be millions, may not make much difference to the sea level, but it can provide enormous quantity of water not only for the cultivation of land, but also fulfill all other, all other needs of life on Earth. The idea of desalination plan as an artistic idea is based on Earth's potential 
to transform things and comprises a complex cycle of continuous transformation from the sun's energy to the growing of plants. This can be understood by dividing the cycle in three parts. Number one, sun's, sun's energy, which is plenty around the world, when brought in contact with water, transform itself into steam, then to mechanical energy. Number two, Mechanical energy can either be used directly or through the production of electricity to run the desalination plant. In the third cycle, water fertilizes the earth, which then produces trees and plants for the life of humans animals, birds, and insects. This phenomena actually happens in nature. But when it is replicated through an artistic imagination, science and technology, its control results in how the very phenomena of nature that is replicated. The role of artistic imagination here to think, initiate and create, not what is self-consuming by the ego, but from with the, sorry, Initiate and create not what is self consuming by the ego from which the idea emerges, but what can transcend this ego and become part of the collective energy of the earth and transform it. it in such a way that transformation not only enhances the natural potential of the earth itself, but also the collective creativity of life of all its inhabitants, humans, animals, plants, insects, etc. The idea of desalination plants is not just a conceptual artwork, but can be realized materially. It is also meant to be an example of a broader conceptual framework from which many more ideas and projects may or can emerge. My manifesto for the 21st century would therefore be for the artists to abandon their studios and stop the making of objects only. Instead, they should focus their imagination on what is there in life to enhance not only their own creative potential, but also the collective life of Earth inhabitants. The world today is facing enormous violence, and this violence will increase in the rest of the 21st century as the Earth's resources shrink due to the stupidity of the kind of life we now live and pursue. Art can and should strive, strive for an alternative that is not only more humane, but is beneficial to all forms of life of our planet. 
we humans we humans are the gift of the mother earth and it is now our duty as its guardians to protect it from its impending disaster thank you